David shouldn't have quite unmuted my mic yet because I had to deal with my mask, which last week I stuck in here, so I had to sneak around the back and get another one. Masks are inconvenient, especially when you try to drink a cup of coffee. That was fun when I did that. Well, we only have three sermons left to focus on the book of Acts. And yes, uh, we could keep going, but it's going to be Thanksgiving and Christmas very soon. And I am convinced that we need to allow Scripture to speak to us through those events, to remind us how faithful God has been, how blessed we truly are. And I think uh, also with the wonderful um, turning the clock back, as the nights get darker, we need to stop and celebrate, reminding ourselves that Jesus is the light that has come into the world. That he has come to bring life to humanity. And so I'm excited to see what God can do when we focus again on those promises that he continues to keep. So that just gives me uh, three sermons today and two more to finish nine chapters of the book of Acts, which I know I can't do. But I'm going to do my best to help focus on the text and allow it to speak to us because it has done an awfully good job of transforming my thinking over the last eight months. So today we're going to be in Acts chapter 19 and 20. And this uh, section of Acts forms another one of those transition moments. Um, up until this point, we've been looking at Paul uh, busy preaching the message of Jesus and establishing churches and strengthening them throughout the region of ancient Greece. Uh, but the rest of the book of Acts is going to focus on um, Paul's ultimate journey to Rome. And it's uh, clear he didn't fully understand the journey he was just about to begin. Paul's going to be arrested in Jerusalem. That's the advantage of growing up um, in going to Sunday school and hearing lots of sermons. You guys already know the flow of the rest of the book, right? You know that Paul's on his way to Jerusalem. He thinks to kind of have an ultimate confrontation, I believe, with the Jewish leaders. But that's not how it's going to play out. He's going to get arrested there for his own safety. That's an interesting thing. And because he is a Roman citizen with special rights, he's going to make an appeal that he gets to speak directly to Caesar. And then he's going to travel a very bumpy road all the way to Rome. Acts 19 and 20 sets up that beginning of that journey. There's a bit of a familiar story in Acts chapter 19 where Paul is in Ephesus and people get upset with his preaching. Very familiar routine up to now, right? The preaching um, this time has come in conflict with, well, the economy. There are those that believe that his preaching is going to persuade people to follow Jesus and no longer be interested in the worship in their city and the economy that it supports. So don't worry, I'm not going to spend any time this morning talking about how sometimes um, suffering in our pocketbook causes us to question the reality of the lordship of jesus that would be uncomfortable and since uh, comfort tends to blind us to the submission of jesus i certainly wouldn't want to bring that up and uh, it would become too personal too quickly i'm afraid and i would never want to suggest that uh, our vision of this scripture is really focused on condemning the culture outside that would be too easy to say that our culture is obsessed with power and wealth, idolatry for certain, forcing it to reject the authority of Jesus, the reality of God's rule. I'm afraid it would become too personal, you see, and force me to acknowledge that uh, really it's the internal struggle, my submission of Jesus in the light of my abundant blessings is difficult. So I won't bring any of that up. I wouldn't want to disrupt our very comfortable life. So don't worry. I'm sure the economy has never caused you to have any concern 
for following Jesus. I do want to remind you, however, of where we left off last week. Do you remember Paul's rescue in Corinth? It came at the hands of a public official. And if that wasn't enough to remind you that God is ultimately in control, that he has many people that he uses, um, it's repeated in Acts chapter 19. Those that are seeking to confront him and stop him want to have him arrested, but a city official, I'm pretty sure that's akin to a mayor, says, whoa, 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 and he puts the brakes on it. It would appear that God is actually in control of people all over everywhere and that they all serve him and his plans and his priorities. It wasn't just in Corinth, and we're going to see that repeated. Why does Paul get arrested in Jerusalem for his own safety so that he can have his platform elevated to the highest in the world? an interesting reality that when we realize that the suffering that sometimes we go through that we want to blame leaders around us our political leaders and the culture around us that sometimes actually living in submission to them regardless if we like it or not can elevate the call of the gospel and it's something i think that we need to remember and keep focused on But the text I really want us to zero in on today is found in Acts chapter 20. It says, Paul readies himself to leave, to depart, to say goodbye to people that he will not see again, and he wants to speak to the leaders of the churches. And so the text begins in verse 22. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that if that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you, and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Still going to do it, Dave. You sure? Nope. I haven't muted it. 
okay. I really can still hear it. Do you want to fix it? Okay. I'll ignore it then. Okay. We look at this passage sometimes, and I think that we want to focus on the work of Paul, this inspired apostle, the unlikely one called to witness to the Gentiles and to help the church transition from a Jewish sect to a multi-ethnic global community. I think the story of God's people is meant to inspire each new generation to set their hearts on following God. So Moses, Joshua, David, Daniel, Nehemiah, Peter, and Paul, they all speak to our hearts and employ us to face the challenges of our own lives, the moments where we struggle, and to reach out in faith to a God who can rescue. Burning bush moments, walls that block us, giants that taunt us, lions that roar, tasks that seem impossible, and moments that threaten to overwhelm us because our fear of what people will say and do to us, if we speak the truth, we believe. These are opportunities that are presented to each one of us to take what we believe, the truth we profess, and to stand in the presence of the witnesses that have gone before us and remain faithful to the mission and purpose of Jesus. Scripture speaks to each one through the testimony, the experiences of the faithful that have gone before us. And so Paul might be the hero of this story. He might be. But his call is for each of us to run our own race. The call is to believe that our lives are precious to the God who has saved us through Jesus and that our life here in this place is not the thing to be prized and held on to, but that the life we are receiving from God is the only thing worthy of our attention and our focus. And so Paul stands in this moment calling you to believe that the most important thing you can do is to respond to the call of the kingdom and live for Jesus in confidence that his promises are true. To not be swayed by the false promises of security that the world around us wants to offer. And so the text asks you to consider right now what are you willing to sacrifice to serve the kingdom? I really can't. It's all right. I'm just concerned about all the people on the other side of the camera because I could turn it off for us, right? But... This message must be important. Right? There must be somebody that doesn't want you to hear that the call of Scripture is about what you learn and do with it and how you allow the stories of the people who have gone before you to shape your life in the here and now. It is a simple thing for us to want to focus on eternity, to think about living a life better somewhere else, and to want to imagine that Tuesday won't come, that Jesus will instead. Wouldn't it? But Paul is speaking through the, this message in Acts saying, but life is not done yet here. And there is before us, unfortunately, church, 
more suffering to be endured for a purpose to proclaim the gospel, the truth, the reality, the lordship of Jesus and his kingdom. I was thinking recently how um, it's easy for us to think in terms of a kingdom as a place with borders. And I'll even sometimes use the language that we need to expand the frontier and push the kingdom out. But the reality is that the kingdom of God is not so much a place as it is dominion. The reality is that we serve a king who reigns, but only when we live in submission to him. While it would be nice for me to think that Jesus would set up his kingdom over the city of Portland, the suburbs of Gresham and beyond, the borders of Oregon, the United States, and the globe, the way he establishes his kingdom is very different, isn't it? It is based upon the subject, the one willing to receive the gift of eternal life, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, and the willingness to be obedient in subjection to the authority of Jesus in my life that the kingdom expands. And that's hard. And so Paul stands as a prototype, much like David facing down Goliath or Joshua walking around the walls or Daniel singing and praying in the lion's den. They are examples for you and I to follow. Paul is willing to walk the road ahead of him not because it will be fun, enjoyable, or he'll gain a better reputation. He's willing to do it because, you see, the phrase is, this life of mine I count for nothing. It's the glory of Jesus he wants to see. And so the call of Scripture is imploring all of us to respond in faith, to live the life that we have accepted. That life is the reflection of Jesus and his glory in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. We are called to understand the inheritance that God has given us. And it isn't simply the gift of eternity. It is the very presence of of the Holy Spirit of God indwelling in us now. It is the very power that we seek to overcome the circumstances that we face. It is meant to be the strength of the church. We are meant to understand the abundant blessings we have, that the people that surround you bear the Holy Spirit. And they are placed in your life as living witnesses of the glory of God. So that you can set your hopes again on the truth of who Jesus is. And the words of Acts 20 reflect the message of Paul um, in the book of Ephesians. And the promises and the responsibilities that each believer has and can claim. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live 
when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. We need to invite again the power, the gift of the Holy Spirit and let it transform us into the people of Jesus to be a reflection of him, to be a living temple, witnesses of his glory, and to set our sights on living a life that is about witnessing the true power of God to save, to bring that saving knowledge of Jesus to the world around us. This is the mission of the church. It's the one that we signed up for and said we understood. Maybe we didn't know the road that was ahead of us and how rough it would be and how much suffering really lays ahead of the church. But it doesn't matter. This life is not the thing I'm counting on. This life is not the one I'm set to live. I'm living out the life that Jesus has extended to me because he is the power of God in me. And so each of us is called to witness again, to reflect the glory of Jesus, to invite his presence. And I'm pretty sure that everybody in this room has already accepted Jesus. But I pray that as we sit here and we transmit a worship across the globe, that somewhere somebody wants to know what it is to claim Jesus as Lord and live in submission to him. And we'll seek that out. And so as we center our thoughts through song and focus on the Lord's Supper, the gift of Jesus, I pray that we would let these words not only transform our heart, but convict us to be people of the gospel, the message of Jesus, missionaries living in the world right now, no matter where it will take us or what call we'll have to answer, but that we will serve Jesus alone and that we will be the empowered witness that he needs us to be. I'm going to invite you to stand and sing, just like the old days, because I see the title of the next slide, and you need to stand and proclaim it, because it's true. <laughs> 